Alzheimer disease, an illness that most people have heard of. For those of us who've been touched personally by it within our families or through people we know, we have firsthand experience of its devastating effects. For others, newspapers, magazines, television, or radio have created an awareness of the disease. But how much do we really know about Alzheimer disease? What causes it? Who gets it? What cures it? While medical research hasn't been able to answer those questions yet, we do know that it is a disease of the brain. And just as all our mental, physical, and emotional activities are controlled by a healthy brain, the symptoms of this disease are produced by the affected brain. In this module, we'll look at the symptoms and effects of Alzheimer disease through the stories of two families who have faced the disease up close. And we'll talk to an occupational therapist about what we know and what we don't know about Alzheimer disease. Yitka Zgola is an occupational therapist who works as part of a community outreach program. In her role, Yitka works extensively with people with Alzheimer's disease and their families. Alzheimer's disease is a um, dementing illness, an illness that affects the outer portion of the brain that's called the cerebral cortex, where the person's ability to um, remember, reason, perceive, and communicate is controlled. We really don't know what the causes are. No, there's lots of speculation as to what the causes might be. But at this point, we really don't have any clear idea of what causes it. Some of the myths around Alzheimer's disease are that it's a normal part of aging, uh, that it's an in inevitable thing, that it's um, caused by drinking out of aluminum pots, that um, it's hereditary that people with Alzheimer's disease become incredibly strong, that they invariably become aggressive. None of these things are true. Alzheimer's disease is, is a disease that happens after the person has already matured and grown into their personality. And so it's something that happens on top of a person's personality that's already individual and crystallized, and so it affects every person differently. Um, the inability to plan a complex task, uh, for instance, getting dressed, getting their clothes on in the right order, getting them on, on the, in the right orientation, inside out, backwards, upside down. Um, even planning something very simple like making a cup of tea can become a very complex, difficult task, or taking a bath. There's no cure that we know of now for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are medications being tried that are hoped to either forestall or uh, reduce the severity of the symptoms. Um, we haven't seen anything that will reverse the process. But that doesn't mean that a lot of work isn't being done in a w in, with the aim of making life better for both the patients and their families. Um, even though there's no cure, there's a lot that we can do to make their lives more comfortable and meaningful and um, help the person use the skills that they still have left. Things like the ability to um, experience pleasurable sensations, emotional experiences, the ability to do old familiar tasks, especially the repetitive tasks, simple things like being polite, saying please and thank you, um, the feeling of being helpful, the feeling of being needed, the feeling of being involved. Those are all things that the person can still experience and that's what we want to give them. It's out here that everything comes into focus for David Kramer. As the adrenaline starts pumping and his body finds a steady rhythmic pace, the worries, the stresses of the day are washed away replaced by a feeling of strength, of fighting spirit. Since David was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease three years ago, a five-mile run has become an almost daily ritual, the chance to clear his head and revitalize his body. I suppose I get the greatest pleasure out of the Y because it's all eye-hand coordination. You get rid of all your frustrations. You know, you burn yourself out, and you come out of there, and you're clean as a whistle, mentally clean. David and his wife, Sonny, have been married for 38 years. Their comfortable condominium reflects their lifestyle and interests. Sonny's paintings, mementos of their travels, and photographs of their three children and nine grandchildren. Well, David was always the absent-minded professor with a wonderful sense of humor. 
Uh, sometimes he put the wrong socks on or the shirt that didn't match, but that was David. Not much of a house husband, but then that was the generation of the 50s when one married. It was the Donna Reed syndrome where the daddy went out to work and mommy stayed home. That's how we raised our family. Our family, that's how we did it. Um, a nice person, which he still is. When I lost my job, it was pretty clear. I was not responsive. I couldn't respond to, to, uh, to questions and things. I just couldn't handle it. So if something was wrong right there, and that goes back right to the beginning. We don't, there was something wrong. We don't know when the beginning was, because no. as I stated, he always had been absent-minded. When he came home and said, honey, I've lost my job after 33 years, and in retrospect, it had been coming on for quite a long time. The absent-mindedness just became more acute. I don't know if David recognized it, but I certainly did. Um, we know if David went out to the store for three things, he'd bring back one. But after 30-odd years, you're used to that. When he got to the store and didn't remember anything, or got halfway to the store and couldn't remember where he was going, um, very often he didn't tell me or he would cover it up and say, oh, I met somebody and I forgot where I was going, or, or he would cover it up. It seemed like the end of the world <laughs> at that point, because you can't have your car. You can't, you don't work. You're down to zero, and you have to deal with that. So that's tough. I was stunned. I wasn't surprised. It, it suddenly made sense the, the last few years. It made put things in its perspective. We had uh, a lovely home with a pool with uh, skylights and bathtubs, uh, you know, two of us could swim in it. We, we just, we'd finally reached the pinnacle of the, f the material success. The next day, I put the house up for sale. Um, just made arrangements to change our lives and planned to do it and didn't discuss it with David I uh, did discuss it with him, but had already made up my mind that I was going to have to make the decisions in the family. I don't know if the word Alzheimer's registered. It was, you can no longer drive your car. And this is what David focused on for weeks after. What do you mean I can't drive my car? I'm going to That's have... all he said, you can't drive your car. Yeah, that was... He focused on that. He hung on to that as an anchor. And we argued about that. He wanted to go to have another driver's test to prove he could because the doctor had written the Department of Transport that his license should be cancelled. I have to anticipate roughly what he's going to do and then plan to make sure it's all tidied up or turned off or whatever. He doesn't turn the stove on. He, he can't figure that one out. And he no longer turns the microwave on. He phones, but uh, he's dialed long distance incorrectly occasionally. It's like raising a child again, but knowing that they're not going to learn from their mistakes or, or things that they have forgotten to do. Uh, one of the hardest things to talk about, I think, is I'm a celibate wife. That was one of the things that's cropped up as a major uh, symptom, shall we say and one of the things I wanted him to go to the doctor about. I thought it was clinical depression because of the firing. And in speaking to various doctors, it could be part of the brain. They don't know, that's the whole thing, that he is unable to, to perform. In an effort to battle the symptoms of the disease, David became actively involved in several drug trials. I'm on a new program now. And I'm popping these little pig and all these little things. I don't know what they're going to do. When you Just because some doctors figure maybe we can fix it this way. They don't know. Nobody knows. There is no cure for these things. All, all, all you can do, all they can do is arrest the deterioration. If you can do that, I'm happy. This deterioration is very gradual now. I'm, I'm certainly aware of it. I don't like to think about next year or two years. I don't know what's going to happen. What's relevant is what I'm doing now and what I'm going to do tomorrow and what I'm going to do the next day, and how I'm going to function, how I'm going to operate. My psychology says you focus on what you can do and do that. Don't worry about everybody else. If 
are not that important. What's important is how you relate to them, that's all. And that's life. So it's not so bad. And I think that's important. It's not so bad. When Alison Ignatieff died in September 1992, at the age of 76 of complications due to Alzheimer's disease, she was remembered not only as a wife of a diplomat, a talented, passionate artist, and a devoted mother of two sons. She was recognized as a fiercely independent woman, who to the end retained the essence of her personality, dealing with people and things on her own terms, in her own way. As her son, Andrew witnessed his mother's decline, most notably in the latter part of the disease. She was h highly opinionated. She had something to say about just about everything. Um, she was also quite a private person, so that she had moments of, of quiet where she would withdraw into herself and, and either work at her painting or read. And uh, she and my father had a tremendous repartee. Uh, they would joke and tell stories about each other and about the life that they'd had. Um, and uh, so she was a very vibrant personality. Both of them were, um, but my mother particularly. I think one of the things that they say about Alzheimer's disease is that it's, it's just, it's indistinguishable from the normal process of aging, but it's not. It's a very different thing. And um, I noticed that my mother had begun to become forgetful, and, but I noticed it more and more. Uh, I noticed that she was cooking the same things all the time, that she would seek out my father in argument and then pursue it to the bitter end. And it was very, very significant rows over very inconsequential things. Um, my father then started to phone me and he'd say, um, Our, my American Express is about to be cut off, Our, the phone bill is about to be cut off, what am I going to do? I don't know what's happened. And, and uh, I eventually went upstairs into my mother's uh, desk and found all their American Express bills, their phone bills, their heating bills, everything jammed into the desk to the point that you couldn't open the desk anymore. Um, she knew that that's where she did that type of work. She knew she was supposed to do something there, but she knew that something that was seriously wrong, and it upset her terribly, made her very angry, and provoked a lot of the, the conflict with my father. About the seventh year that she had Alzheimer's disease, um, we would come in and I'd say, so what's for dinner? And she'd tell me exactly what was for dinner. And then we'd divide up the tasks. And by the time we stopped doing it three years later, I would be uh, explaining to her that you took a carrot and you peeled it like this and I'd show her how you did it. And then she'd stand there looking at the carrot and then she'd say, what do I do now? And I'd say, you turn the carrot over and you do the same thing again. And then she'd stand there looking at me and she'd say, what do I do now? And I'd say, you turn the carrot over and you do it again. And so I never had to ask her, and I knew exactly how she was losing her gross and fine motor skills, how she was losing her ability to make decisions, her ability to, to carry out even the most simple of operations. Um, and I could adjust my own behavior uh, accordingly so that she never had a sense that someone was watching her and, and spying on her, which was one of her greatest fears. I was coming in about five evenings a week and on the weekend to cook meals for them, do a lot of their uh, banking for them, make a lot of the decisions for them. And it was just becoming an incredibly complicated situation. And uh, I had a conversation with my father just before he died in which I said to him that we really couldn't continue this any longer, is that mother really needed more constant care and the stress on him was too great, and the stress on me was too great, um, and that she'd reached a point where I think that we should consider institutionalization. The decision to put her in the institution was an incredibly difficult one. Um, despite all we'd been through, uh, it's a terrible thing to think of this person who you love and whose whole recent history is based on a terror of being locked up is to put them in an institution and we looked at 27 and we chose one. And um, the day came, <clears throat> the day came for her to go into the home. And this is a very difficult moment for me because I, I had always said that she never would go into a home. And um, I said, how am I going to tell her this? So I, I lied to her and I said to her, uh, you know, your back's been bothering you, mom. 
and I think it's time he went into the hospital and had some tests. And it's a very nice hospital, and I think he'll have a very nice time, and in a couple of days you'll be out. And she said, fine, and she went in. And she went in lamb-like, and uh, she loved the place from the first moment she went in. She thought it was great. She, she loved the smell of the food. She liked the bright lights. And after living alone with her husband and her son and the caregivers for four years, she loved all the people. The image that comes to mind when I think of my mother is that she was a great, loved films. She always used to go to the movies and watch movies and watch late shows on television. And you know in those early movies when, when Lillian Gish and Richard Bartle must kiss, and there's this wonderful scene in this flowered bower like this, and suddenly it blacks out, and it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And the last shot, you see them kissing, just see their mouths kissing like this, and then it blacks out. And that's exactly the image I have of my mother, um, is that right till the last moment of her life, that her personality did not change at the core of her personality. She lost the ability to think. She lost the ability to walk. She lost the ability to talk to people. She couldn't talk at all. Um, everything was gone. But at the core of her being was this very affectionate, very warm, friendly person, loved good company. She loved delicious food. She loved chocolate and things like that. Um, she loved flowers, you know, sunlight and stuff like that. She loved going out into the park. All the things that were at the core of her being, so that although Alzheimer's had ravaged her as a person and it spared her nothing, um, the 5% that was left of her personality at the end of her life was 100% my mother, 100%. You know, uh, it was uh, always a pleasure for me to see that, uh, that despite everything that Alzheimer's disease could do to her as a person, that she never lost the core of her being. Alzheimer's disease involves the gradual decline of physical, social, and intellectual abilities. While there is still a lot more to be learned about the disease, its causes, and hopefully one day its cure, we are able to clearly identify its symptoms. Through your knowledge and understanding of this disease, you'll be able to better adjust to the changes that may occur within your clients while maintaining quality in the care and the service that you provide.